then the, the man the thought just came to me and just I know it was the Holy Ghost. He said, There's no such thing as a good or a bad church. There's trained and untrained. <laughs> he said, So train my people. He show them what I've shown you. I said, Okay, I got that. So you know, there's really no good or bad churches, man. There's just there's just trained and untrained. We want to be trained, amen? amen. Why? Because God's training us for what's coming. Now, you know, there's a lot of things coming. I mean, we see uh, even now gas prices are going up, food prices are going up, a drought has hit the Midwest, Corn, you know, farmers are starting to get concerned, and we've been talking about a storm is coming, and we all maybe don't know what the, to the total meaning of that is, but we don't have to. God is preparing us. His word is still true. His, he is still the Lord. He is still on the throne, and there is no weapon formed against him can prosper, and those that are in covenant with him, well, there's no... Uh, there's no way that anything is going to wipe them out, amen? So we don't have to worry. We don't have to get in, in, in fear about any of that. And uh, Jesus came to establish that mighty name. And so, um, you know, in the things that were going on, you know, they, they were, the, I was listening to a couple of the, everybody I know is, is listening and hearing the, the, you know, the candidate, the, the president, and all the things that are being said. And, and I wonder if we really know what's being said. <laughs> I really wonder. I mean, because, you know, they're talking about one of them has a plan, you know, about the economy, and, and uh, he wants to lift the regulations off of the investment banks and, and free up the money to the, to the lenders and so that people can, you know, can once again borrow money. And the other one is saying, you know, that's not going to work, and it hasn't. And I wonder if they know that in, in, 19, in the 1929 era, when the Great Depression hit, it was the disruption of credit that caused the fall. If you don't free up the banks to, to lend the money out, and people can no longer, you know, I mean, if, if their jobs are not affording them an opportunity to have a pay increase, then they've got to be able to do something. Amen? And when you cut the credit off, you have what's called an inflation and a depression. And we don't want that, do we? How many of you know we don't have to worry about that? It doesn't matter what they do because they can't fix it anyway. All right? So, but God can and God established something in this earth, in his church. He gave them some authority and power. And I, I was thinking about this. I said, you know, I, I think about scriptures like when he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, David said, or his seed begging for bread. So if we're begging for bread, th now is this a fair question? If we're begging for bread, can we call ourselves the righteous? Come on now. I mean, those, that's a valid question. If we're begging for bread and worried about bread, can we call ourselves the righteous? David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Can we? I mean, it stands to reason. Is that not right? You know, if, we are, if we're struggling in, in our finances, in the financial realm, if we lack financial provision, can we call ourselves the just? He said, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. So, so we, we can't just continue to call ourselves something that doesn't match up what he said. Amen. And, and if we, we don't have to worry about it if we line up with what he said. We don't have to be like Judas. We don't have to sell out. Amen? We don't have to make our decisions based on that. We can, we can honor God. All right? He'll take care of your needs. But we've got to understand some things. If we lack physical wellness, can we call ourselves believers? Come on, somebody. Now, I'm not trying to put condemnation out there. I'm just asking simple questions. Because what we're about to read says otherwise. Amen? Jesus said all we need to do is be believers. Amen? Not worry, not try to figure it out. Just, just do what we know to do according to God's plan. So I believe it's just time to get back to, to God. That's what I really believe. And uh, no, no self-denial or self-deception. I believe there needs to be a distinctive witness in this earth today. Can somebody say amen? And that witness can only be the church, the redeemed of the Lord. Now, those, those are going to fit into here. Now, Jesus speaking here, what I love about this, this is the end of one of the Gospels in Mark chapter 16. And it's Jesus' teaching. And the Gospel was lived out. For three and one half years, Jesus preached and he taught them in the synagogues. He, he came and he brought the Word. He brought revelation to the Word they already knew. He showed them how the Word would apply to their lives. And he didn't just tell them he healed the sick. He cast out devils. He, he spoke a language that they had never heard, even though it was their own language. They'd never heard such words. They would say over and over again, we've never heard it on this wise. 
It was, a, it was a new, it was the same words, but it was a different language. Are you following me? He healed the sick. He, he, he fulfilled the gospel. He provided for it without dependency upon the world. He, one time when they offered him, they said, Who, how are we going to pay taxes? He said, well, what is the inscription on the coin? And they said, well, Caesar. He said, well, render to Caesar that which is his. And unto God, that which is his. And he said, go over here, and there's going to be a fish. And he's going to have a coin in his mouth and pay our taxes. I mean, come on, somebody. If that's not something that says you don't have to worry about where it's coming from, we've got to get back to believing again. We've got to get ready for we don't know what's going to happen with the decisions that are being made, and we actually have no control over them. But what we do have is the word of Almighty God. And the gospel was lived out for three and one half years. And his, his words before ascending up into heaven were these. First of all, he went to his disciples that had been with him for three and a half years and really couldn't wrap their minds about, around what was happening. They had, in three days, they had left from Jerusalem and went back to the place where they were familiar with and the job they were familiar with. But, you know, thank God, Judas was the only one that sold out and he did that for a buck. About three or four thousand dollars in in modern day price, if you want to know about silver and what silver would be worth. But here's what he did: he came and he appeared to them and he sat at meat with them and upbraided them. He scolded them because of their unbelief in verse 14 and the hardness of their heart, because they believed not. They they because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And this is what he said: he didn't. He, he scolded them. He just said, you know, you've got to get back to the believing part here. Amen? And here's what he said. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, how difficult is that? Is that simple? It wasn't no gray area. There was no in-between. There, no, there was no confusion. There was no uh, analytical description. It was just real simple. Believe, and you'll experience salvation. Not believe, and you'll be damned. So it's only two categories. <laughs> Amen? It was no cultural thing. It was not about the color of a person's skin. It was not about where they lived or where they were raised or any of that. It was simple. Believe or not. Everybody say believe or not. not. Now, they quit believing and he upbraided them. And and in encouraging them, he said, now get busy, go and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes or not believes. I'm going to have two categories. And he said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And goes on to say, So then afterward the Lord had spoken to them. He was received up to heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord was working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Now I'm a just firm believer here that that's part of the gospel. <laughs> All right? I mean, it it's either is or it's not. Are you in agreement? Now, now, here's what he said. You know, these signs shall follow. So what does that mean, shall follow? This is getting to the topic tonight. These signs shall follow. Well, that's an expression that implies of covenant. It implies dominion for anywhere that I make a stand for God. In his name. It's not subject to location. It's not subject to one area or another. It's not subject to any, any topical on this earth place. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe wherever they go. It's gonna, that's why I said follow because if you're in a place, he said, wherever you place the sole of your foot in the Old Testament promise, wherever the sole of your fo- foot shall tread. You shall have dominion, right? Amen. All right. You shall possess the land. And so this implies, shall follow implies that wherever I go, 
If I go and make a stand in his name and uphold his name for his glory to be revealed, he said, you're going to see the results. That's what he said. Just believe. Now, believe what? That's another good question. What are they to believe? What did he do for three and a half years? He, ex he exemplified, he showed them what the gospel is. Not just preaching, but power. All right? So I wonder if the gospel and his name had anything to do with each other. So, so in essence, what you're seeing here, church, and the way that it's written in the original language, this is what it, it is implying, is what it's saying. It's a covenant testimony. These signs shall follow wherever they go, them that believe in my name. He was establishing his name, his authority, who he is, what he is, that would never change in any generation at any time as long as there were believers there. You follow? Now, this puts pressure on our, on our believing, doesn't it? But it's all right, because pressure will make you either grow <laughs> or not. So we need, to, we need to have the challenge. We need to understand where we are in our generation. He said, wherever you go, in Zachary, Louisiana, wherever on the, on the globe, on any map, and you believe. You see, the gospel was about establishing his name. So if, they don't, if there's those that don't believe the gospel of his name and the power of his name, then what do you think is going to happen? There'll be no signs, <laughs> right? right? If, if his name is just the, the tag on the end of a prayer, then that prayer has nothing other than a religious intention. That's it. You know, we know now, we've used the name of Jesus, and I'm telling you, it, it's, it's flowed through the church, and I'm trying to help you to understand that we've got to do more with this thing. Because if, if a preacher prays or someone prays, and they go, in the name of Jesus, everybody goes, Amen. It's kind of like the conclusion of a prayer, and that's not how they used it. He didn't say, in my name, you're going to conclude every prayer. He said, in my name, you're going to preach the gospel that I established. Now, these signs followed him. They're going to follow us. They have to if we understand that we believe in his name. He said, now, let's get into what, what I want to get to tonight, and that is this. Dominion in the name of Jesus. Everybody say, dominion. In the name of Jesus. Why? Because it was a name established in covenant with God. It was a name above every other name. It was a name that would never be, never be reckoned with defeat. It would never be likened to those that were damned, to those that were, that were begging bread, to those that, that, that could never have enough, to those that greed had taken over their life. How many of you understand that greed can turn a want to a need just like that? And we can come to God and we can have our, our greed and we can just pray in the name of Jesus and we can do all that and call this and call that. But if that name is not used properly, because he gave dominion, power, and authority in that name, completely and totally. Now, what were the signs? We see them. We see them right there. Five signs. Jesus' name is the covenant name that gives dominion authority to all those who believe. We have any believers in here tonight? Come on now. I know you do. We've got to get back to the value that God placed in that name. We've got to understand that that name is given to them that believe. These guys were abraded because they quit believing. They, got, they lost sight of what the name was. The gospel all converged into this last statement that Jesus made right here. All of it culminated right here in the last part. He said, now in my name, you've got to go. And when you go, wherever you go and anywhere to every creature, every nation, every kindred, every tribe, every tongue, and you use that name properly, he said, these signs are going to follow. Now, that's not a suggestion. And it wasn't just a good thought. Jesus meant what he said. It's a covenant name. Everybody say a covenant name. Now, let's, let me... Let me let me take a little bit more time with you tonight and show you what we're talking about, about dominion. And how ed, all five of these signs were about dominion upon this earth. I did my little word study. I did my little, you know, breaking it down, man, just looking, meditating. What does it mean? So he said, in my name, these signs shall follow. Number one, they shall cast out demons. Now, we talked about that last week. I'm not going to go back and do all that tonight. But let me just say this. Demons 
or your least worry if you're a believer in the name. A demon can't steal, can't kill, or can't destroy that which is believed by the believer. All right? Can't do it. I mean, we got people that are afraid of demons that don't realize that demons are afraid of the name of Jesus and the person that would bear that name with honor and integrity. The problem is that honor and integrity is far and few between anymore. I can't help that. All right? But as for me and my house, you know, you understand? We, we're going to honor that name. And so he said, in my name they shall cast out demons. Now here's the literal Greek. It says that they shall force out demons from their house or dwelling place of occupancy. It doesn't just mean in a person's body or in a person's life. It means wherever. It means if you show up at the Holiday Inn in the middle of a funky town, wherever that may be, and you get over there, man, it doesn't matter if you show up there and make a stand for Jesus Christ. Look, you, those dudes can't stay there. I used to do it. I know people that still do it. Man, they go in the hotel room, they get the oil out, and they, you know, they're just making it hard for the cleaning people. They don't understand all that. You know, just sprinkling oil all over everything like this. You know, man, come on now, that's just religious. It's super spiritual. You understand? I go in his name. I'm not going to represent my name. All right? If I want to go, then I go in his name. Now, you understand what he's saying there? So to cast means to force out demons from their house or dwelling, wherever they're dwelling. If they're dwelling in somebody's life, if they're dwelling in their body, then bless God in the name of Jesus, get out! Now, how long does it take? How long does it take? How many of you think it takes a long time? <laughs> I'm telling you, that's the least of our worries. Th those little dudes have no authority that matches the name of Jesus. None. Zero. Zip. And they have to obey them that believe the gospel. The gospel is all about his name. Go preach the gospel in his name and about his name. So they shall force out demons from their house or dwelling place of occupancy. Jesus said, you know, an unclean spirit has gone out of a man. He walks through dry places seeking rest, finding none. And he called that man a house. So it doesn't matter whether it's a house. It just means you force them out from where they have set up their occupancy. If they want this, both of us ain't going to stay there. How about we say it like that? The two shall not dwell together. <laughs> All right? All right. Now, the other question is, do I have a right to be here? Do I have a right as a human being to be on this earth? You bet I do. Why? Because I was born with this body. Just like we talked about last week. They went on, the demons weren't on a crusade for Christ when they said, you know, what are we to do with thee thou, Jesus, the Son of God? They were saying, as the Son of God, you have no right to be here. Because when we saw you up in glory, when we saw you in your pristine, in your, in your pre-incarnate form, you know, you didn't look like this. So they were accusing him of stealing a body. And he said, no, no, I have authority as the Son of Man. And I'm going to give that authority back to man. Because what man lost, I've come to restore with the good news. The good news in my name. What a name. Come on, somebody. The second thing is, he said, they shall speak with new tongues. Now, in this one, it just simply means this. In the Greek, it says, they shall declare a new language that will be backed by heavenly authority and give them dominion. That's why when Jesus would speak words, they would say, we've never heard it like this. It wasn't just tongues. Now, we have the gift of tongues that simply announces that we've been filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking with a language we don't even understand. Come on, can you say amen if you've been filled? But the other thing is, it doesn't mean just the gift of tongues that come through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It means a language that has authority in it. It means now they'll speak words. That's why Jesus said, whosoever would say to this mountain. He didn't say you had to pray in tongues to the mountain. He said, if you'll speak in any language to this mountain, it doesn't matter whether you speak Swahili or English or Arabic or whatever. If you're a believer in the name and you have Christ in your heart, you can speak in any language and say a new language that has authority with it. Come on, bro. Come on. Because they were speaking all kinds of languages that had no authority. And I will remind you, we do the same thing today. 
because we have not been trained with the use of this name. They shall use a language now. People hear the words, but they see so many things happening as a result of that word, they're going, what's this? We've never heard it like this. It doesn't mean we go around speaking in King James English. I command thou that in the name of the Most High God. All that good stuff. All that stuff that we breathe it into what we think is the anointing. Man, it's just simple. In the name of Jesus. Demons know that name. It's time for us to know it. We got saved by it. They'll speak a language that will be backed by heavenly authority. Now, let me tell you this. Gossip doesn't count. Backbiting doesn't count. The, the, the gospel prayer line, I'm sorry, the gossip prayer line, as a Christian, well, I know I can't gossip, but if I call them and tell them, we need to pray. You know, we, we got a prayer need here. I, I can't tell you what it is, but I got to. Because you got to pray. You need to quit all that stuff, man. He didn't say call up the gossip prayer line. He said use the name of Jesus. Now, is it wrong to call somebody to get an agreement? Absolutely not. But if that person doesn't understand the role is not just to get your ears filled with somebody else's problem so that you can compare it to yourself and think you're doing good because you don't have their problem. Come on, somebody. This thing is simple, church. It, it, he made it simple. He said, you'll have a language that heaven backs up. Don't use foul language and don't use empty words. <laughs> Jody and I... Years ago, we had a, had a, a, a uh, situation, and uh, Jody kept telling me, she said, I feel icky about it. How many of you know what icky means? <laughs> all the ladies, all the ladies. And, and I told her, I said, don't use words that don't have meaning. <laughs> I said, I don't, I don't know what icky means. It's not in the dictionary. I don't understand it, so, so don't use that word. I, I said... Does it make you feel uncomfortable when you're around this person? Does it, you away? What is it? Yeah, icky, yeah. Well, I know what it is now. <laughs> but then it was a vain word. It had no meaning. It was empty. It was a language I didn't understand. I couldn't use it. I couldn't define it. So I went ahead and did what I was planning on doing. And boy, did it ever back. I understand what icky is now. <laughs> when my wife says icky now, I'm like, oh, oh, oh yeah. Now, I got icky now. Me and icky... Me and Icky know what each other's talking about now. But I had to get definition for it, man. I didn't understand it. You know, you understand my dilemma there. Okay, so sometimes we learn our language the hard way, don't we? We learn that our words will condemn us and our words will bring judgment and our words spoken that don't have meaning. Now, that doesn't mean you can't joke around and tell a Boudreaux joke. You understand? But when you're serious about ministry, when you've got to get the job done, you don't use words that have no meaning. You've got a language backed by heaven, and if you're confused about what it is, just read the book. He said, in my name. I don't have to have some formal, you know, doctrinal prayer. All I've got to have is a name. And I mean, the simplest person on the earth can do that. And authority over demonic forces and evil and authority to speak words. See, in other words, he's saying they will dominate by the words that they speak. That's what he means when they shall speak with new tongues. They will have a language that brings dominance. Come on, everybody say dominance. So that word, we're talking about dominion in the name of Jesus. We're talking about a name that I don't have to worry about what's coming. I don't have to worry about the decisions of someone who... who you know, is, is, is guiding the, the, the steering the direction of this nation or this city or any other thing. I've got a name that's above them. I'm telling you right now. And so I can speak language that will bring me bread. It doesn't matter if they cause us to go into a depression. It doesn't matter. Come on, somebody. The Bible says it'll cost a bag of gold to buy a loaf of bread. Well, we're either going to have a lot of gold to buy the bread available or we'll have the bread to get the gold. It doesn't matter. But we've got to have wisdom, we've got to have wisdom, we've got to understand how our words are important. We, they dominate, they shall speak with new tongues, they will dominate with the words that they speak. So if you're not dominating, maybe you ought to check the words you're speaking. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> you 
Are they empty words that have no meaning and no impact that they really don't need to be said? Come on, somebody. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Didn't the Bible say that my people are destroyed for lack of? See, we know that. Well, it's a, bit, a gross lack of knowledge to understand that, man, we think we can get away with just speaking any old words we want. You can't. We're held to a higher standard as a believer. There's a darkness moving in on this land, I'm telling you. It's a spiritual darkness. But there's going to be a spiritual brightness if we're trained and ready. Then the third thing is, he said, <clears throat> now this one was a little bit trickier. This one took me a little time. It says, and they shall take up serpents. Now, I didn't know if that was a command that I had to go practice that or not. <laughs> I was like, do I have to prove my faith like some do? Come on, how many of you have seen the guys on TV, those, you know, up in the mountains of wherever? And, the, I, you know, I don't, don't want to say where, but anywhere. But you might be from there, I don't know. But <laughs> they go in there with these bag of snakes, man. They got to prove and dance around with them snakes. I said, boy, if I got to do that, man, I'm, I'm done. But what's he talking about? What is this type of, uh, and shadow of that will have dominion over serpents? Jesus said in Luke's gospel, he said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. But you shall tread on serpents and scorpions. Let me just clarify it real quickly because we're back to school night and I want to get finished up here around 8 o'clock. But serpents were always tied to the one serpent that we know the most about, and that was the one that showed up in the Garden of Eden and slithered his way up there and spoke to Adam and Eve. So what is that a type of? When he said they shall tread upon serpents, what, was he, where, what is the implication here? Not that we go dance around with snakes to prove our faith. The literal Greek says they shall destroy the work of serpents. They shall destroy the work of serpents. Now, they understood this then because they were all about the Bible and not about culture and not about cultural relevance and not about, you know, about all this other stuff we have today, about customs and all that and tradition. They were about understanding type and shadow. So when you use a type of, of, of reference to a serpent, its original First introduction to mankind was deception. Come on, somebody. A serpent and deception of any kind. They shall tread upon deception, deceptive vices, deceptive things. All right? They shall have dominion over deception. Then that means we don't have to be deceived in the name of Jesus. We, we just have to understand the language. They would have understood it this way. We philosophized it away, but the truth of it is, the Greek says, they shall destroy the work of serpents, things that cause deception or fear. How many of you know that, we're, that it's natural, a natural enemy to humanity is a snake? Benny. <laughs> I called Benny up here one day because we had a snake in the foyer. The size of the snake is irrelevant. It was a snake. The kind of snake is irrelevant. It was a snake. Benny said it was only this long. I said it's about that long. So it's somewhere in between those two. <laughs> but the reality of it is, I don't care if it's a king snake. That's not related to you, is it? Anyway. So, <laughs> I don't care what the snake's name is. I don't care if he's a friendly. I don't care if he eats mice and bugs. I don't care what he does. He's a natural enemy of mine. I, when I, my first, I don't like being surprised by him. I don't like walking up on him. You know, because the first instinct is fear. <laughs> so we can understand when he says you'll have dominion over things that cause fear and deception because you'll know the truth and that truth that sets you free from fear and deception. You have dominion over the things that cause deception. Amen? Then the next one says, this one also took a little bit of time because I had to really, I, I, I translated it out and I, I said it still didn't make much sense and then I translated it again and I went and I looked up, you know, why would he say something like this? What's it a reference to? That if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Well, in their culture, it was a common practice. In that day, 
If you didn't like somebody, just put a little poison. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You know, I mean, serve you up a little cup of poison here. You know, your favorite drink, your little wine there with a little bit of arsenic in it or whatever. You know, I don't know what they had back then, cyanide, whatever. I don't know if that was even around. But whatever they put in there and that person would drink and they'd die mysteriously. Oh, yeah. What's that, brother? Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, you follow me? So he says you don't have to be afraid of things that would be that would come against you unbeknownst to you. That's right. You don't have to worry if the devil's got some kind of secret plan, new level, new devil. You don't have to worry about that. That's right. Why? Because you have dominion even over something if he tried to come with you with a sneak attack yeah. and freshen up your drink. <laughs> Can't do it. Amen? Now, if you're an alcoholic and get cirrhosis of the liver, come on, somebody. It's a deadly thing. Y'all not listening to me tonight. All right. Then the last one is, that one is, they shall have dominion over secret plans that steal, kill, or destroy, whatever they may be. That was a culture. That was a reference. They understood that, you know, you, you got, I mean, you would get afraid if you, if you offended somebody, you was afraid to drink anything and you'd die of thirst. You know, or either that or you go, you know, you go out of your way to go get something that nobody's tampered with. But they got afraid of that kind of stuff. You follow me? And then the last one was, and he said, and they shall lay hands on the sick. And then that valuable part too, and they shall recover. They would restore health in the name of Jesus. But what was the key? Dominion authority. If you're not under authority, you don't have authority. We got to quit playing this church game. You understand? We got to be serious about covenant relationship and understanding what this doesn't work just by happenstance. It doesn't just work because somebody opens the Bible and opens their mouth and says they know a little bit about it. This works God's way. Amen? That's the only way it works. And so in the days to come, we can know this. Turn to John 14, and I'm closing. Praise team, come on back up here. I want to show you something else. I love this. John 14, very quickly. The use and dominion in the name of Jesus. What does it cover? Well, we saw five signs that would follow. We would have dominion, no matter where we are on this planet, to, to tread over demonic forces, whether they're in, out, in a house, in a person, wherever, all right? We know that we will declare with a language that has heaven's backing it. We would have dominion by our words. We would have dominion over the serpents or the things that are deceptive. You understand? Deception causes fear when we don't know. But we have dominion over that in the name of Jesus. All right? We have dominion over secret plans of the enemy to steal, kill, or destroy. We have dominion over sickness and disease. How? The gospel in the name of Jesus. Tell the sick the good news. You don't have to be sick. Now remember, if someone doesn't believe it, they're not going to benefit from it. You understand what I'm saying? There are those that don't believe that healing is, is around today, so they're going to get sick and they're going to stay that way. You follow me? But Jesus said, them that believe the gospel of my name, the good news about my name. And this is going to explain why. Why is this? John chapter 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, Jesus said, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because. Everybody say because. Because I go to my Father. You follow him? And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Well, it's real simple. He said, because I'm not going to be here physically, I'm going to give you the same thing that I represented on this earth, and that was the Father. Jesus just simply means Yeshua, salvation. You follow me? And so he says, so that you'll know I got back to the Father whom I was representing, and now I have established this name on the earth, and I go back there. You now have the right as a believer to use that name. And we just saw over some of the things that were exercised by the authority in that name. 
because, he said, that's, that's, that's where we get it. And then he says, verse 14, he reemphasized, he said, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Wow. He said, I'll do it because in my physical absence, my name represents everything that I've shown you in the gospel. It touches every need and every situation, everything. But we've got to believe. Now, when we face circumstances that seem to contradict that, <laughs> and we go and we pray and we put that ending on our prayer, and nothing changes, we've got to start doing things different. That's how we should start. <laughs> I represent him. I make a stand for him. It's not about me. Jesus always said it's not about me. I mean, didn't he say that to, to Philip? He said, don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me or else believe me for the very work's sake? I mean, the works things are what make us believe. That's what they're for. That's what the signs are for. To cause people to believe. Hmm. He said, if you believe on me, the works that I do, you'll continue. Why? Because... He established that name of dominion authority. Greater works. You know, we've always talked about that one. Had to get a little revelation of that one. Stand up on your feet if you will. <clears throat> Greater works. You know, it's a real simple word. Greater, megas. Mega. I mean, you know what mega is. You know, well, we got giga now. Oh, and then we got even one now above that. I forgot what it is. It's... Yeah, terror. Yeah. Look at you, brother. No, he didn't tell you that. You came out there with yourself, man. You got all this computer stuff down pat. That's awesome, man. <laughs> so anyway, we got all these things, but mega. That just meant the most. That's the biggest. And so, you know, when, when we talk about it in those terms, Greater works, mega works, more. Why is that? Does it, we, we're like, what well, does that mean? We're going to do greater than Jesus? No, it just simply means we'll be here longer. He, he did it for three and a half years. Amen? Well, how many of you have been saved more than three and a half years? All right. We got to go back and start getting these opportunities we passed up. Amen? We got to get our faith back in that name where it belongs and start seeing the works because he sees at the right hand of the Father and his work was finished. He said, now them that believe in my name. And you know, he said that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He said, we're both sitting here, sent back the Holy Spirit now is the power and response to that name because you have heavenly dominion authority that backs the language of the word. Amen that puts the faith in that word, that puts the power back in it. It's amazing to me. And when Jesus said this, and I'll conclude with this, he said, whatsoever you ask in my name, I will do. Now, I know Jesus isn't a liar. And I'll tell you, growing up in church, in, 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 in Central Mile, I didn't grow up in church, but growing up in this new full gospel environment, that's what I got born again into the full gospel, the full believing, and yet not seeing the works. It just baffles me. I said, God, why is that? He said, because the church has been full of, filled with unbelief, with doubt, with formality, with tradition. He said, son, we got to get out of that if we want to see it. Amen? We're going to see it. Because when Jesus said, I will do it, in the Greek, that compounded Greek word, he says, if it doesn't exist, I'm able to make it come into being able to manifest it, manufacture it, manifest it. Isn't that amazing? He said, in case you didn't hear me the first time, anything you ask in my name, we, st we need to start seeing some things. How many of you agree with that tonight? We need to start seeing some things big. We need to start seeing Jesus big. We need to start seeing the possibility realm instead of the impossible realm. We need to start looking at the future with a whole different set of eyeballs. 
Some that see what God says, independent of what the news says. I've been noticing, you don't hear a lot of good news anymore. Used to, they'd give us a little taster, a little teaser every now and then, something good. Not anymore, man. It's, it's just about all bad now. Come on, somebody. It's amazing. 